Today, the place was the quiet town of Montgomery, Alabama. No matter asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men. We face, therefore, a moral crisis. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! We are free at last! Mr. Lincoln, you have the floor. Can't Look Away. Dialogues on Photographs of the Civil Rights Struggle. I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art. As our series continues, Kenyon College scholars delve deeper into the history and legacy of the civil rights movement through images of remarkable moments captured by photographers who witnessed the demonstrations for racial justice of the 1960s. Engaged with urgent issues of racist violence examined earlier in this series, this subsequent set of discussions helps us understand different modalities of black Americans' resistance to oppression. These dialogues offer us views of courageous assertions of human dignity in the face of insidious and brutal racism and highlight the unrelenting resiliency, strength, and beauty of African-American culture and community. In this episode, Royal Rhodes, Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at Kenyon College, in conversation with Jody Kovac, Curator of Academic Programs at the Gund Gallery, explores the origins of the saying, I am a man, seen on strike placards carried by Memphis sanitation workers in two photographs from 1968 by Ernest Withers and Stephen Shapiro. Professor Rhodes traces the origins of the slogan to its use by 18th century British abolitionists with whom Kenyon College's first donors were connected. Let's join their discussion. Royal, I'm so pleased to be talking with you about two of the photographs from the collection that I think are a couple of the most powerful. Um, Steve Shapiro's I Am a Man from 1968, and then Ernest Withers' photograph, also from 1968, with uh, demonstrators carrying the same sign that we see a single man carrying in Steve Shapiro's photograph. And you had brought these to my attention because uh, you had a lot to say about this slogan, I am a man. And in the photographs, these are being carried by um, the Memphis sanitation workers who are striking in the wake of the death of two um, black sanitation workers, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, who died um, in a horrific tragedy when they were crushed by a, um, a, a, a sanitation truck that was malfunctioning. And shortly after this, uh, union organizers and civil rights activists came together and the statement that they used, the idea for this, um, for this to use this slogan on these placards uh, was born out of their collaboration in fact, Jesse Epps, who was a union organizer brought to Memphis, uh, had said that this statement was inspired by the Declaration of Independence, specifically the phrase that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And in the context of the, the sanitation workers' strike, uh, it really calls into question the idea of equality as it was put forth in the Constitution and in, in the Declaration of Independence. And here it becomes a real assertion of dignity. And then you pointed out to me that this, this statement, I am a man, has a really long and rich history. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about that. Okay, um, just to go back to... Uh the situation with the photograph of uh, the uh, gentleman holding the, the sign, I am a man, and notice that uh, the um, am part is underlined for, uh, for emphasis. Um, I was struck by that because I think it's addressed to the viewers. And so we look at the image of the sanitation workers on strike, but really the audience 
who is being appealed to and informed and instructed is us. You know? And as a white man, looking at that, for me, it's a remembrance of how my privileges and my position have allowed things like uh, racial injustice to, um, to be present in, in, in our world. As you said, uh, the sanitation workers uh, went on strike in uh, 1968, um, in February of, of 68, because of the tragic death of, of, of two workers who were ordered by the mayor, despite torrential rains and flooding and uh, other dangerous uh, situations, to work. And all 1,300 sanitation workers in Memphis were black. Uh, as you also said, um, civil rights leaders, uh, in conjunction with uh, labor leaders, uh, met uh, in Memphis. And that's why uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was there, um, because he reiterated over and over again, there are no civil rights without economic equality and rights. And then it was in April, April 4th, 1968, that he was assassinated. But many people forget that he was there to protest the uh, economic situation of this um, very badly treated uh, group of, uh, of black workers. Um, I, I was struck by their choice of the, the motto, um, I am a man because it reminded me of a Wedgwood Jasper Ware image uh, created by Josiah Wedgwood in 1787. Wedgwood wa became a Quaker and uh, became affiliated with the British um, abolitionist movement. Um, we think of the abolitionist uh, movement as a political social movement, but we forget that it, in Britain, where it began, it was part of a religious reawakening of uh, engaged Quakers and also religious evangelicals. Um, the Bible was later used by many southern and other sections of the country, um, Christians, the, um, the misinterpretation of the story of Noah and the condemnation of uh, one of his sons and grandsons was colorized by those misinterpreters and used as a biblical basis for ch chattel slavery. And uh, the British abolitionists rejected that. They said, um, slavery is a sin. There is only one human race. Um, Enlightenment science began to suggest there were many species and many races. The biblical mandate was always there is one. All men are created equal. Um, and it was Captain um, um, John Newton um, who was one of the most influential figures in that evangelical movement in England. And he influenced, you might say, he converted William Wilberforce, the parliamentarian, mm -hmm. to, um, to uh, espouse the cause of, uh, of abolition, and it was formally abolished. Slavery was formally abolished in, uh, in England in 1807, but of course remained many parts of the world long after that. Um, Wilberforce was a member of one of the founders of what has been called the Clapham sect. It was a section of London where many of these social reformers um, lived. Social reformers like Hannah Moore, um, like Sir Thomas Ackland, 
if uh, Kenyan students have been on the Exeter program, they've probably seen the statue of Sir Thomas uh, Ackland um, in a park near the cathedral. But also people like Lord Kenyon, Lord Gambier, Thomas Wigan. So what do all of those figures have in common with Kenyon? They were the donors to Philander Chase, who sought help to found a college, to found a seminary initially, uh, west of the Alleghenies in the United States. And he was able to raise that money because his contacts in England assured these various people um, who the Kenyan song says uh, uh, gave their pearls and jewels uh, for, the, for the building of this uh, new seminary and college um, because their contacts said that uh, Chase considered slavery a sin and uh, a heinous blot on humanity. So uh, Josiah Wedgwood, as I said, at, at his own expense, uh, constructed 300 cameos um, with a um, rather uh, striking image. And he borrowed that from the uh, Society for the Abolition of Slavery. And it showed a naked man, um, nearly naked, with only a loincloth, um, raising his shackled, chained uh, arms with the inscription, Am I not a man and your brother? Um, I, I've been thinking about that image and that uh, quotation for a long time. And I think the image, while a stereotypical image of a enslaved person kneeling, really conveys the idea that this person is beginning to stand up rather than continuing to be prostrate. Um, and uh, the phrase, am I not a man, is a question again posed to a white audience. Um, but the phrase goes on to say, and a brother, which I think is a religious affirmation, not a biological or social affirmation. But we are not only human beings, one with the other, but we are born to be brothers. Uh, I also learned quite recently that there was another image circulated by the abolitionists, and it was, am I not a woman and a sister? Uh, so there's a kind of early feminism um, in, in, in that. Um, I think um, um, also it's connected, these images are connected to the controversy in uh, 2020 about the emancipation or Freedmen's Memorial in Washington, D.C., showing Lincoln standing and a black male again uh, in the position of the Wedgwood um, cameo uh, image, uh, having his shackles broken. It was to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation. It was to, uh, um, to honor Lincoln after his death um, and uh, was paid for by donations from freed enslaved persons. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass spoke at its dedication and, um, and said, yes, honor, honor Lincoln, not for his intentions, which raised some questions, but for what he accomplished. And a little uh, later, um, Douglas uh, wrote this to a, uh, a paper, uh, The National Republic. Um, it was an 1876 le letter in which he said, Admirable as is the monument by Mr. Ball, who is a sculptor, um, in Lincoln Park, 
It does not, as it seems to me, tell the whole story, and perhaps no one monument could be made to tell the whole story of any subject which it might be designed to illustrate. So already at that time, people were beginning to question um, the kind of benign civility of um, those who align themselves with the abolitionist cause, but were really not deeply aware of how symbols and language could still be used to denigrate and uh, enslave people. We have that in our world today, um, don't we? The use of uh, terms like thugs, brutes, savages, lowlifes. Um, those continue that implicit racism uh, linguistically, yeah. um, as well as uh, through other uh, uh, images. Right. Oh, if I could oh, sure. um, just interject for a moment, because I, I, I want to comment on um, so a few things that you said. First, I, I really find your interpretation of the position, the kneeling position that you described in the Wedgwood silhouette, um, the kneeling position of the, the man, the slave, um, as it, in the moment of rising up, because it, that um, image has been interpreted as, um, kind of in a, as the slave is in a supplicating position. He is, um, can only be redeemed or saved or brought to manhood mm -hmm. by the moral um, and uh, benevolence of the white man. Mm -hmm. And again, in both cases, we're talking about men. And so I, I, I'm so glad that you brought in mention of the, how this inspired <laughs> an early expression mm -hmm. of feminism mm -hmm. too. So on the one hand, there are, we can look back at that history as, as you pointed out and see that this was, this was a very um, progressive statement and yet there were, um, it did not necessarily ascribe um, equal value to uh, blacks, enslaved peoples in, um, in that time and place. However, um, when it, it, it's obviously a very inspiring statement because it has been used again and again and recovered for, for different reasons and most powerfully in the sanitation workers' protest. And I'm wondering if you could comment a bit about how um, in Steve Shapiro's photograph, where the, the, the photograph or the, um, the placard is on its back and we see the protester from, from behind. Again, it's a silhouette, but he's in a very different position from the slave mm -hmm. in the Wedgwood silhouette. With arms uh, raised. The Wedgwood uh, silhouette uh, asks a question, am I not a man? The um, photograph shows the way in which that original uh, motto was transformed into one of agency. I am a man. Um, and uh, whether or not uh, people understood uh, the religious significance of the term I am as a name for God, but because we are created in the image and likeness of God, as the um, Christian uh, theologians uh, and uh, Jewish um, theologians have said, um, then it becomes a, uh, a moment of affirmation of one's uh, identity. I took uh, the uh, position of uh, the person carrying that sign with arms raised also as invocation and affirmation. Um, and that it was on his back that so much of the hatred, so much of the uh, disparagement, the lack of uh, um, giving human dignity, um, calling uh, black men boy, um, that he was showing um, what was really uh, an antidote to that on the back that was so often whipped or uh, oppressed with, 
with, uh, with burdens. Um, I think it ties in uh, to the, uh, the other image um, um, that uh, Withers uh, did of the large group. And so it was not just a singular individual. Suddenly you see a large number of people bearing the same uh, sign, um, the solidarity of, of the group. And that reminded me of Malcolm X and uh, his autobiography and the pilgrimage to Mecca, one of the great personal testimonies of what that pilgrimage uh, means. And Malcolm X um, said that he was always um, part of a minority in the United States, but going to Mecca, he realized that there were hundreds of millions of Muslims uh, throughout the world, so that even when a Muslim might be praying alone, he said, Salam Aleikum, Salam Aleikum. Well, there's no one visible on either side. Yes, there are hundreds of millions of co co-believers. And that's why I think it was uh, um, interesting that uh, former President Barack Obama uh, said this, using somewhat of the language of I am a man. He was talking about Malcolm X. He said, his repeated acts of self-creation spoke to me. The blunt poetry of his words, his unadorned insistence on respect, promised a new and uncompromising order, martial in its discipline, forged through sheer force of will. That affirmation that I am a man, I am worth something, I think was important. And I think Malcolm X probably captured that better than anybody else. The photograph of the, the group of sanitation workers is by Ernest Withers, and he is unique in this uh, collection of photographs because he, he's one of the few who is actually African-American. Um, most of the photographers were white photojournalists who were uh, committed and very involved in the civil rights movement, but they, they had greater access. Um, to a lot of things, too, that, uh, that African-American photographers didn't. Uh, Steve Shapiro, for example, worked for Life Magazine, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, others. He had a very successful career in um, photojournalism and also in uh, as a set photographer for Hollywood films. And I think that carries over into his work that we, especially that we see here, he, because he's known for his really iconic photographs. Um, portraits of James Baldwin, for example, or Ray Charles, Samuel Beckett. Um, all of these were published in a book called Heroes. And so I think that this photograph, I Am a Man, of the, the singular protester, um, has a heroic quality to it. Meanwhile, Ernest Withers, uh, he, he immerses us in that demonstration. Um, he is. Uh, he was very involved with uh, civil rights activism in Memphis. Uh, he became really known, well known as a photographer in 1955 when he photographed the trial of the murderers of Emmett Till. And while there, he met um, Medgar Evers and became very close with him. And following from that, he. Um, spent time in Memphis and was very active in the strike, actually. He, he even made some of the placards himself, the I Am A Man placards. So I, I think that the biography, the history of these photographers is, is interesting when we look at them side by side, when we look at these two photographs side by side and see how they approached um, their way of portraying the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. I think another uh, factor um, is that these photographs have become iconic references for other uh, artists. And uh, I think of Marcellus uh, Lovelace, who did uh, artwork uh, based on these. But going back to the, uh, the photographs th themselves, 
Um, the uh, the single uh, man um, raising um, his arms um, made me think too about the way in which um, black athletes were sometimes photographed at the end of a bout, at the end of a game, at the end of a, 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 a race. Um, and in a way, for me, it was an evocation of a kind of um, identity of someone who had really accomplished something. So tying back to that idea of personal dignity yes. and worth and, um, and value, um, and remember, this is around the time where the uh, photographs of uh, um, Olympic athletes you know, um, were, uh, were circulating and being talked about still. Um, I think uh, also with that photograph and the photograph of the whole line of uh, protesters and um, just the daunting size of that number of, of people coming forward, yeah. I, th I think, also has an emotional impact in these, um, in, in these photographs. As you, as you said, um, uh, it was often uh, non-black photographers who were able um, to, um, to take these, uh, these images um, for lots of different reasons, economic reasons as well as uh, um, political reasons. Um, um, and not having black photographers um, being allowed to, uh, to take uh, many photographs. Um, but one of the things I think people looking at the f these photographs should pay some attention to is the clothing. Um, that these were sanitation workers, and yet at the demonstrations, they were wearing clothes that were clean, you know, well um, presented. Uh, one of the um, charges against the city of Memphis was that the sanitation workers were so poorly paid, about 65 cents an hour, and they had to deal with conditions that were uh, just subhuman. Right. Um, and so many of the, uh, the vessels in which garbage was, was left were old and broken, and so they would be inundated with all kinds of things. And one story I, I read talked about how a sanitation worker would go home and take his clothes off at the, at the door and shake the maggots out of the clothes and then go in and wash and to be with his family. So the importance of clothing, it's not you know the old 18th century clothes maketh the man, but in a way it's conveying I have as much dignity as anyone else in, in society. And tying it back to Malcolm X for a moment, um, it was also something in the autobiography he talked about. Um, he said that he knew his brother was going downhill when he showed up in just really dirty, rough clothing, instead of, as Malcolm later did, always appear in a suit and his signature bow tie and stuff, to make a statement. Um, so clothing can be not just a statement about rich and poor, but also about the regard that people should have for others, about the care that they put into how they dress. Think about the way in which in many black churches, the Sunday best would be a mark, not of competition with others, but to show their dedication to community mm -hmm. and their dedication to God.